I was with about 90 Afghan security forces, that is, soldiers and members of the Afghan border police, uh, as well as about a dozen U.S. military trainers assigned to these Afghan forces. And they were on a mission to search the village of Ganjgal in eastern Kunar province for weapons and then hold a meeting with the village elders who had uh, reached an agreement to renounce the Taliban and accept the authority of the local government. The village is located uh, at the eastern end of a valley that runs west to east and is surrounded by mountains behind it and on the north and the southern side. So it's kind of like a horseshoe-shaped valley. And the unit that I was with was moving up the valley uh, from west to east towards this village, which is kind of uh, fortress-like in that it is perched up on a rise at the eastern end of the valley and is made, uh, 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 comprises compounds made of, of stone uh, and therefore, it, as I said, it resembles very much uh, a kind of fortress. The operation began at about 3 o'clock in the morning with a column of Humvees moving in the direction of the village. As the sun began coming up, and the dawn here actually begins quite early, uh, we left the Humvees behind and began making our way up the valley towards the village. And at about 5.30 in the morning, when the first elements of this column reached the very outskirts of the village, the first shots were fired, and they quickly grew into a, a storm of machine gun fire and rocket propelled grenade fire. And we quickly became pinned down behind the stone wall of a terraced field, the fields running up to this town are all terraced like a layer cake, and each one is separated from the next by a stone wall. We found ourselves trapped behind one of these stone walls, and it quickly became apparent uh, that the insurgents, while keeping us pinned down, were beginning to try and flank us and the rest of the force uh, by moving around on these northern and southern ridges that surrounded the valley. The officers I was with began calling for support from heavy artillery and helicopters. Uh, and we had been told, uh, that assured, that uh, helicopters would be coming within uh, five minutes if uh, or once we began uh, once the call went out, uh, by my watch, uh, the helicopters took about 80 minutes, and it later emerged that the few helicopters that operate in this particular part of Afghanistan were actually engaged in a battle further to our north, and that two pilots had been shot, uh, which explains why the helicopters were not forthcoming as promised. Uh, as far as the artillery support that was uh, supposed to be forthcoming, uh, U.S. commanders uh, s uh, declined to provide it, citing new rules that were instituted in an effort to reduce civilian casualties here in Afghanistan. And so for uh, about three hours, uh, this battle raged. And uh, at one point we found, at a number of points, we found ourselves having to retreat under fire uh, as the militants tried to work their way around our flanks to get better shots at us.
by my recollection and the notes I was taking, uh, they waited, he waited about 20 minutes uh, before summoning uh, air and or uh, artillery support. And he kept being call, told, at least as far as the request for helicopters, 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 minutes. And it became apparent that the helicopters were not coming uh, during, in the time that he was being told. And yes, uh, we realized after the first 15 minute interval that they weren't on their way. Uh, we, we were in a, fair, again, a fairly exposed uh, position uh, in a furrow of dirt, and it became obvious that we had to move from there. Everybody got up and, and began running at once, and I realized that people were bunched up, were bunching up and were offering uh, pretty good targets for the snipers that were firing at us, so I actually stayed in that position. Uh, thinking that it would be better to thin out the group that way, and I ended up being stuck in there, stuck there for about 20 minutes. Um, first, with a Afghan border police officer who, uh, at one point, bounded back uh, the way we had come and left me there, um, kind of pressed into the dirt, trying to figure out what I should do, uh, and and waiting actually for a diminution in the gunfire uh, to make my own break back to where the group I had been uh, with had gone. And, and eventually, uh, I, I was compelled to run myself, uh, irrespective of the volume of gunfire, because I saw um, uh, the, the gunfire, the bullets getting closer to me, and at one point I actually saw one of the snipers fire at me and the bullet bounced and hit the dirt about three feet from uh, my foot. Uh, and so at that point I decided that I had to get get out of there. I also saw uh, that Afghan troops were running back past my position, uh, some of them carrying their commander who had been hit in the groin. And at that point I just gathered up my legs underneath me, sprang and ran as fast as I could, and I know that there were bullets springing up around me, and I got back to the, the next wall where the rest of my group ha was taking cover. I dived behind the wall and nearly landed on top of Captain Swenson's sergeant, Kenneth West Westbrook, who had been badly wounded by a bullet that tore open one of his cheeks and buried itself in the base of his in his neck. Uh, it turned out he's, 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 he's alive, but he was badly wounded and bleeding. Uh, the commander of the Marines, Major Kevin Williams, uh, had been shot in his left arm, and his first sergeant, Christopher Garza, had been badly con con concussed and had lost most of his hearing from a rocket-propelled grenade explosion. And so the only people who were unwounded um, in that group uh, when I got there was Captain Swenson, Lieutenant Fabio, and myself. It started becoming quite obvious that the insurgents were trying to encircle us. Uh, later, Captain Swenson told me that uh, while I was absent, he, uh, two of the insurgents actually came down a hill and started shouting for them to surrender, uh, and he answered that with uh, by throwing a grenade at them. Lieutenant Fabio grabbed uh, Sergeant Westbrook's M4 rifle and threw it at me and said, this is your rifle now, uh, the meaning of which was very clear. If that our position was going to be overrun, and if it was a matter of uh, saving the lives of the men I was with and my own, I was going to use that rifle. Uh, and I had really no hesitation uh, to do that. It was about that point that the first two helicopters arrived, and there was a diminution in the firing, and we understood that we now had another opportunity to get out of there. I, I realized that the only two soldiers who were unhit were Captain Swenson and Lieutenant Fabio, and, and they really needed some help. So I slung uh, the rifle around my shoulder 
and I helped pick up uh, Sergeant Westbrook, who was very badly injured, uh, and uh, held him underneath his uh, one of his uh, arms uh, with one hand, and with my other hand, uh, pressed a field bandage against the wound in his neck uh, to start, try and staunch the bleeding. And I don't know who it was. I don't remember uh, who it was who grabbed him on the other side. I, I think it was Lieutenant Fabio, but I can't remember. Uh, and we basically walked, stumbled uh, back again down towards the valley, uh, the end of the valley. And, and I thought for a few seconds that we were going to be okay because the fire had slackened and no one was shooting at us. And then suddenly it all picked up again. And um, we couldn't run. Uh, Sergeant Westbrook is a fairly stout man. And we ended up having to try and gently lower him to uh, the ground behind some other cover and lower ourselves to the ground uh, behind that cover as well. And he was in extreme amount of pain and he was crying out. Um, and I was trying to hold the field bandage on his bleeding neck. Uh, and, and at one point realized that one of my sleeves had, was streaked with his blood. And we had to get him up to one of the fields, a nearby field, about, I guess about 50 yards away, uh, where the helicopter was going to land. Um, and I, again, I forget who else was helping me, but uh, I grabbed him and the other person grabbed him and we had to beg him to help help us by pushing himself up on his feet, uh, to which he, he, which he did, but it, it, again, he was crying out in great pain. And again, we started moving uh, towards the field. There was still gunfire, uh, but um, we then realized that we were actually below one of these walls uh, that, that separate these terraced fields and that we were going to have to get him up the wall in order to get him into the helicopter. And, and, and we started trying to drag him by his clothing, and he had passed out by this point. Um, and suddenly, two other people just sort of materialized and helped drag us, helped us drag him up the wall. And at the top, once he got to the top, uh, the helicopter had landed uh, at that point, and two people... My two soldiers were at the top of the wall, and they grabbed him and pulled him up. And at that point, I basically sank down and, and to the base of the wall to try and catch my breath. At this point, there were, a and, uh, there were Afghan Army reinforcements and U.S. soldiers coming up into the valley. And uh, we waited behind this wall until there was another slackening in the gunfire, and myself and... Major Williams and uh, Sergeant Garza, uh, because they were walking wounded, were able to walk their way down uh, to a aid station. After Major Williams and Sergeant Garza had received very initial examinations and uh, bandaging, uh, in the case of Major Williams, and some um, anti-nausea pill uh, for uh, Sergeant Garza, uh, we were put in MRAPs, the big uh, uh, armored trucks that the U.S. military uses, and driven uh, back down to the U.S. military base where they uh, underwent uh, medical treatment and, and were actually medevaced out uh, of the base uh, for, better, for further treatment. People became convinced that we had been set up. Uh, once it became apparent that the ambushing force was one uh, that knew what it was doing, that the ambush was laid out by someone who had military training uh, and military skills and was being launched by a large number of people who were armed with very powerful weapons and at no point that I could discern or anyone else could discern ever had a problem of low ammunition, unlike the Afghans and the Americans who ran out, who were running low on ammunition uh, within uh, an, a couple of hours of the, the, the start of this. Neither I nor the American troops I was with 
had ever been in anything like this before. And, and these troops were all veterans of Afghanistan and Iraq. And I have uh, covered stories from uh, Kashmir to Sri Lanka to Afghanistan, Bosnia, Iraq, Kosovo. I've been in firefights before, but never in my entire life have I ever experienced anything of the kind that I experienced the other day, and hopefully never will.